Okay. Um, hello. Good morning. Um, I am doing this at the behest of Dave, but also because we get quite a lot of questions about it here now. I'm Daniel. I'm one of the admins on the Star Dot. Um, I have had Acorn machines for some years. I've still got my very fun hand Acorn Electron sitting here um, on the shelf. But uh, oh, what I wanted to talk about today was preserving decaying floppy disks. Um, let me make sure I can see this. So what I'll attempt to cover is a little bit about disks and the drive. I'm sure this will be teaching a load of people to suck eggs, but may not. Formats of the disks, a little bit of a discussion about the philosophy of preserving them, how we can go about preserving them, including the tools needed, and a case study, um, and then I will try and answer questions. I do not profess to be an exceptionally detailed expert in all aspects of this, but I have a, an overview of doing it, and I've done it quite a few times with quite a few different discs. So we'll see where we get to. Right. Um, I should also say that I've pillaged lots of this, and I've learned lots of this from uh, Jean-Louis Guerin's website is excellent um he has collated a huge amount of information about the sort of low level workings of floppies and protection on the st and all sorts of other things um and i thoroughly thoroughly recommend having a look at his website if you want to try and burrow through more so floppy disks um i think everyone has probably seen one of them from eight inch all the way down to, to three and a half inch, some of which are high density, some of which are double density. Um, but they're dying, the data on them is harder to get off. We've got fewer machines that can deal with them. And, and so that's really what we want to sort of try and look doing, at doing is getting the data off, off those disks and preserving it for, for future use. And, and be able to access it as it as it was originally accessed. Um, a little bit about the drive. So essentially, what the drive is is doing is reading magnetic fluxes off off the surface of the disk. So the disk is is a piece of mylar coated in a in material or in an iron oxide that can be magnetized and that spun around and the head just sits above it and just measures when the polarity or the, the way that the, the iron oxide has been magnetized flips a change in polarity or a flux and it'll have a something to spin the disc on many systems there's something to check where the disc is so that's that index index led i don't know whether you can see, oh you can see that nice index led so that tells it where it is so on a on a five and a quarter inch drive, that's a hole. On a three and a half inch, it's the orientation of the spindle. Um, something to drive the head up and down, and something to also to tell you when you've you've hit the end, and you can't go any further. Um, so what's actually on the disc? Well, this is, as I say, flux changes in polarity of the surface. So when when a disc is written. Um, the right head and a current is applied to it and it lines up all of the little tiny magnets, I guess, within the, in the surface of the disc in one direction. And then it can flip them and magnetize them in the opposite direction. And this goes on. And if you do, if you do this round the track, you can then read it back in exactly the same way you'd read a, a tape back just by seeing, seeing when these polarities change. And it will lead to a little, a little jump in current it'll induce a current in in the in the read head so that's essentially what you're doing you're you're looking at when the polarity of the surface of the disc has shifted and what the disc drive will do is take those sort of subtle shifts in polarity amplify them and turn them into distinct distinct pulses which are what are transmitted back to the computer so the computer gets back a series of pulses or if it wants to write a disc it's transmitting a series of pulses so that's fine okay um you've got pulses going 
going in and out, but what what do they mean? So the actual the most important thing, I've put these in the wrong order, the most important thing actually, so far as the computer is concerned, or so far as interpreting these, is the time between the pulses. And that's dictated by the, the speed of speed of the disk. But you can use the time between the pulses or the flux changes to, to say whether you're you're reading a one or a zero or or oh, that's basically it, ones and zeros. So in uh, I've got two two pictures here. This is a, a scatter plot from well on the left hand side is a is a single density disk. And you can see that the pulses are either four microseconds or eight microseconds between them. And that will be whether so things which have a four microsecond pulse between them will actually be ones on the disk. Things that have an eight between them will be zeros on the disk. And I'll explain a little bit why in a second. And then next to that is a dual density disk. And you can see that the pulses are falling at four, six and eight. And there's a reason for that. And I'll go backwards now and the reason for this is is the encoding scheme so you you've you've got pulses you've got the time between them but you have to work out how to sort of reliably convert those back into ones and zeros so fm which is the format that the or frequency modulation or single density which is the format the bb uses um has a constant ticking of a clock every eight microseconds, which is what you, why you see a zero will still register pulses of eight microseconds. So um, if you're getting two reversals within that eight microsecond window, I four microseconds and four microseconds, that's one. And only one reversal, that's the eight microseconds, that's the clock, which is constantly beating along to keep, keep every, all, the, all the hardware circuitry and the drive sort of sticking with it, that will be, uh, zero. That's fine, and we know that we can store 200 k aside on an AT track with the BBC. Um, but it's not the most efficient use of space. So modified frequency modulation or double density, um, you only get a clock if there is a zero preceded by a zero, and that essentially means that you can squeeze an awful lot more in. For a much smaller space as the bottom of these two demonstrates or illustrates. Um, I think, I mean, the, the, the reason for this is because if you don't have any pulses at all, your phase lock loop in the actual drive starts drifting off and you, you become unreliable. So having pulses at, at least a re, sort of re, semi regular regular sort of interval keeps everything locked in and keeps the drive being able to read the pulses on the disk and keep the time between them. So we've got pulses and the time between we know how to change pulses back into ones and zeros and it's those ones and zeros which actually end up, end up being the physical format of the disk. So within the disk uh, you've got a series of tracks, and each track is divided into sectors, and the sectors have a specific format. And you can go and look at the data sheet for any of the floppy disk controllers, like the 11772, and it'll explain what the recommended format for single density and double density is. But um, essentially, what you're saying is you'll have a sequence of bytes after the index pulse because there's a bit of there's a bit of time after that happens and it could potentially overwrite as it goes right the way around the track and then you'll have identifiers which mark um mark the field it'll tell you the track side sectors the length of the sector so sectors tend to be 128 156 512 bytes 1024 bytes um CRC check bytes and and then gaps. So I mean one thing to note is when you the gaps are really important because some although some computers write entire tracks at once when they rewrite it, lots of others will look for the sector and rewrite the sector. 
And so there's a, a, a slight gap between it identifying the sector and then starting to write, and you get these splices. So having these little gaps in between the ID field for the sector and the actual data for the sector mean that mean that you don't end up overwriting IDs or data. You you've got enough of a sort of gap that you can have this splice in there. And you can see these splices when you actually start looking at the disk. Anyway, so these are single density and double density formats. Sectors repeated across the disk. Um, this is a, a visualization of that. So uh, let's see. So this here, of this is using the HXC floppy emulator software, and it's actually a PC disk. But you can see that's where the index lies. And then each sector, the light green is the sector header, and then dark green is data. The, the data field, and you can see that this software has decoded the sector IDs, the back IDs, the side IDs, side, knows what the mark byte for data is and the CRCs, and also is, is talking about that these cells are actually the bit cells, which are the timing cells on the disk. Uh, so, for our, for our purposes with Acorn machines, um, these are the standard formats we tend to see. Um, they're, they're fairly, I mean, fairly standard, to be honest, amongst many of these things. Um, but, but I think the, the important thing is to be aware of what we'd expect to see when we think about starting to preserve disks and if it doesn't look like that then it's probably not what you were thinking it was or it's um something something special uh so that's disks formats and how they're written and i just wanted to say something a little bit about thinking about preserving preserving these disks um i don't know whether anyone knows what this is you can unmute yourself if anyone wishes to answer no. <laughs> um, this is this is a cave in France called Lasco, except it isn't. This is Lasco 2. Lasco, the original cave, which is famous for, for these cave paintings, these very detailed cave and, and beautiful ancient Neolithic cave paintings. Um, you can't go into. It was discovered by a couple of school children. They fell in, it was open to the public for a while, but it's started going horribly mouldy and it's been sealed up to preserve that which exists within it and an exact replica of the cave was made. Now you could say well we could take pictures of the paintings and that and that's good enough and and that you know we, we can live with that but actually that loses the context and that loses everything. So the next best thing to being able to go to the actual cave itself is to go to this exact replica of the cave. Now, this is happening more and more now with with huge number of ancient sites where we're using laser scanning and all sorts of things to produce virtual representations of everything. But the real key to all of this preservation is trying to preserve the context as well. So what I guess I'm trying to get at here is that we could think about taking a picture of the stuff that's on the disc and just sort of keeping it, so getting the games working and so on. But actually, we probably should start thinking more in terms of preserving those within their context. So if it's a protected disc, you know, all of the protection intact, all of, all of the, the way that disc was originally written, because that's part of the history of the piece of software itself. So, <clears throat> that leads on to different methods of present preservation. So, as I just said, you could scoop the data off the disk and make it work in an emulator. That's what we do with SSDs. That's what you can do with uh, up yours or Beeb as well, if it will happily do it. Um, you can you can copy the disk, attempt to crack the protection, get something that works in an emulator. Off you go. Um, those images you need to know something about what they're designed to work in because there's absolutely nothing other than the raw sector data so it's those 
that data segment that the data most sequentially. Um, it doesn't tell you anything about the geometry of the disk or anything. You can scoop it off and try and include some information about the format. Um, there's a few that do that, formats that do that. IMD tells you something about the the layout of the disk at least and how many tracks and, and so on and how big the sectors are. Um, you could scoop the data from the disk and any information you can about the quirks on it. So FSD and um, AFD, I think you've, you've looked at some of the Archimedes software preservation project, you'll have come across AFD files. They try and store information about the errors which are used in copy protection. So an awful lot of copy protection works by causing the disk controller to produce an error. And spotting that error or an inconsistent result and spotting that when it checks for whether it's an original disk um, is, is what allows it to run. So if you know what those errors that you're expecting to see are and you can inject them into, into the proceedings, then you can fool the copy protection and make it run. So with these, you have an indication of what, what was on the disk, but you don't know what actually caused the error. You just know the secondary effect well the other thing you can do which is what i would advocate is take everything off the disk and don't worry about the format and worry about extracting the data from it later on so really what you're doing here is taking the times between the fluxes so just capturing that that stream of times and that's all these formats are so the SCT format, which I'll talk about a little bit. Well, I won't talk about the format. Um, the uh, Crowflux, which people might have heard of, or the Flux Engine, and so on. All of these formats are basically just recording the timings between fluxes. Uh, so, how do, you, how do you record these? Well, there have been a variety of options. For a long, long time, the Crowflux was probably the only option that you had. Um, you can still buy them. They are 99 euros. That's one. They're probably 10 years old. They are, if you buy one, the support is via a forum um, and is patchy, I think I could say. And I don't think the software has been updated for a while. Um, then you've also got the Supercard Pro, which is supported, does very much the same as the Craftlux, $99 can order it from there. Flux Engine, which David Given has done, which some of you might have seen on the forum, I think you can put one together for about £15. Um, there is the Disc Ferret, which I think is verifiably dead, but someone may may prove me wrong and then the final one is the grease weasel which has been quite actively um supported at the moment um and you can put one together using one of these little blue pill boards for probably about five quid if you really want to um they're not they're not very expensive to put together and that is where you can download the software and the firmware from so uh, um, so what do I use? Um, I have got a, a couple of five and a quarter inch drives that I use. I use a 40 track one and an 80 track one. Um, and those I use with, with a slightly later model of the Grease Weasel. Um, I've got an 80 track uh, three and a half inch drive. I use the HXC floppy emulator software, which is open source and can be downloaded from the website I've given there. I use Keir Fraser's disk utilities. Keir Fraser's the designer of the Greek weasel, a hex editor, and uh, I've been known to use Fairy Liquid as well with this. Um, so there you go. Uh, so that first picture is uh, my, my two five and a quarter inch drives, and that's the Greek weasel F. Seven on top of it. Um, you can buy kits from Kia to put these together. They are a bit, uh, well, they're, they're okay if you're happy to do stuff you can mount. This is one in progress. Um, I think he's charging seven or eight pounds for one of the kits with all the parts. 
Um, so they're, they're not very expensive. Or if you go the, go the other route, which is the F1 route, you need to find yourself a, ah, a blue pill board, um, which doesn't have a fake microcontroller on it. Your mileage may vary. Uh, Bitbox seem to be settling genuine ones. But, you know, up to you. I, if, you if you're happy putting something together, going, going for this, this one is, is probably the best, best route. Um, right, what I said I'd do now is attempt an ill-fated live demo. So what I'm, I'm going to try and do is just quickly, uh, I've got a copy of uh, app, uh, which I've popped in. Let's see, uh, I'm going to share a different window. I've popped in my uh, HTRAC drive. So the way Grease Weasel works, basically, you attach the drive to it, and it, it takes over controlling the drive. Um, and you run it connected to your PC via a USB cable from the command line. You used to have to install Python, but the whole thing is now is now standalone. So let me just share this other window. Um, let's see, that one. Uh, that one, I think. Oh, there we go. Right, okay. Um, has that gone off the bottom, or is it mostly there? Okay, simply, what you're doing, well, you can see the command I just typed there. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read it off the off the other drive. So that command at the bottom is all you need to type. To actually, Hoover Hoover the disk off. I've said single sided. There's no point in taking taking both of this one. Um, and it will just chug along tediously copying the disk. It does three revolutions per track. Um, I'm not sure at the moment whether you can access the different revolutions or whether the HXC software takes them into account when it's trying to decode them. I have a feeling it is, but don't. Don't quote me on that because I don't quite get the ins and outs of it. Um, it's slow and tedious. Okay, so <clears throat> one thing I would also say is that it tends eight uh, five and a quarter inch disc tend to actually have it go up to potentially eighty two tracks, and sometimes you do find data or at least um, recording marks on the on the on the latest tracks. Anyway, what this has now done is created a a file. It's about I think a double sided file would be about thirty meg in size of um, the timings between the fluxes it's in the Supercard Pro format. You've got a couple of different options now to try and process that into something that you can try and look at the data in. And what I tend to do is load it into the HXC copy emulator simply because it gives you a visualization of the buy. Um, so, to load that, okay, I need to share a different screen. So new share, uh, we'll share this. See that? Right, there we go. That's the HXC software. So we say load, and I think it's this one. And that's the file that I just produced. Open. 
Okay, so that's done that. And what this, what the HKC software will do is attempt to decode whatever's on the surface of the disk. So if I click this, whoop, oh dear. Right, okay, there you go. Um, you can see that it has decoded it. You see these gaps between the the track, that's because it's actually a 40 track disc. Um, also, there's an awful lot of red and the odd orange sector which hasn't read properly. Now, that's probably because my drive heads are filthy after having done uh, something with another disc. Anyway, what you can do then, I don't know whether it's show up. Yes. Okay, we can certainly start tidying this up a little bit and say, well, we'll remove the odd tracks because we know it's meant to be that. And you can see where these other sort of flaky bits are. And we could actually say, if I want to have a look um, at one of these tracks which has an error in, there we go there you can start saying well what's gone wrong here and why is it an error and what's the error uh, for this one the crc is bad it could be that one of the bits is a bit flaky inside it i don't know you'd have to look at it in more detail anyway that's the basic principle principle with this once you've got that though and assuming it it looks okay um it's simply a question of um just exporting exporting it to an img file if it's just simply data that you're interested in preserving or, or accessing in an emulator or if you want to use it with um one of the floppy emulators you could save it as an hfe file and those will work natively with that floppy emulator and they will preserve they will work with it if there's this protection on there they'll keep that intact because essentially all it is is a, a compressed if you like version of the flux timings that you've got so any protection remains intact for, for really really preserving it though maintaining those scp files that's if you like your primary source of the data if you've got that you can always create any of the other formats that you'd want to create so having that scp and i, mean, I know it seems big 30 or 40 meg but in the great scheme of things in the modern day and age that's not that's not very big actually um you could store a huge number of them on a memory stick so you know i think i think we 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 sit in the past when we think anything anything bigger than a megabyte is large um anyway so yeah you can export export it from there and and away you go if you find yourself in a situation where um where some of the tracks haven't decoded properly or you've got sectors which are bad the, the the thing that i would probably do at that point is look at let's see if i can get into this Okay, uh, what I would probably do at that point is use some different software to have another go at decoding the disk image. So, um, if Razor, again, you probably find it on his GitHub, has produced a set of utilities called Disk Utilities. They run in Linux, they will run in the Windows sub Linux subsystem. Um, but uh, what, what you can basically do is run that SCP file through through his disk utilities or disk analyze uh, my pace there we go um, and that will give you another run at it and it will attempt to decode it and hopefully between using the two different bits of software you'll end up with enough good tracks to be able to get the data off the thing so that and a hex editor together in piecing the pieces together you should be able to recover a lot more than you would with just one of the bits of the software on its own. Um, so, 
this. So that that was an ill-fated live demo, which hopefully was was enough to at least show you roughly how it works. Um, there are a few little gotchas with all of this. Uh, PC high density drives rotate at three hundred and sixty RPM, and <clears throat> Sometimes it's fine and the software compensates for it. Sometimes it's not clear what's going on. But it's a different data rate than the data rate you'd be expecting with an 80 track double density disk. So be aware, aware of that. That's high density five and a quarter inch drive. PC drives are set to drive one by default. There are a number of people I've seen go, my disk is not working with my grease weasel. And it's because you're asking it to look at the wrong drive. Um, always check your disk for damage or mould first before you run through a drive or you end up with dirty drive heads that you have to clean. Um, keep the lids off your drive and do not clean them with Q-tips. I have personally managed to bend the springs on heads with a Q-tip before and other people have definitely done it and although you may be fine, you probably, well you run the risk of not being fine and knackering a drive. I would generally advise using folded up lens tissue or something like that or even a chamois tip tip an isopropanol and you can slide that between the heads close the drive floor and just gently move it around and you won't put any undue pressure on the, on the head no bill i do not have any five and a quarter inch cleaning discs i do three and a half inch but five and a quarter inch you'll end up having to pay upwards of 20 20 quid now, if not more. I think CJE will hire you one for a week um, for a fair, fair amount of money. So, no, no, I don't have any five and a quarter inch cleaning discs. Um, <clears throat> do not. So, actually, Grease Weasel will let you write an SCP file back to a new disc. Um, don't write 40 track discs and 80 track drives without gaussing the disc first because you'll end up with artifacts left the, the heads are different widths basically and it's fine if you read it in another rate track drive but if you ever take that and pop it in a 40 track drive you'll get crosstalk between the tracks that are written on an eight with with the different width heads um, <clears throat> and also be prepared to mix and match so get the sector editor out work out where things have gone wrong and see if you can pull in data from other bits <clears throat> so I think, I, am I right in thinking that Paul Hiscock spoke to everyone uh, in one, a previous one of these? Um, now, I got asked uh, by, by Dave, um, this is how all of these things start usually, it's like Dave will say, uh, Daniel, uh, can you have a look at something for me? And I said yes, and that's sort of how I ended up doing this. Um, so, basically, as I understood it, Dave had been talking to Paul from who previously worked at Computer Concepts and had a game that he'd written called Android Attack, and there were a load of discs, and he tried to recover the, this off one of the discs, and it hadn't worked, and would I mind taking a look? And I said yes. So, um, what I got was an awful lot of discs, um, and uh, a lot of them were mouldy, quite mouldy. Um, and mould and disk drives do not get on with each other. So when you encounter this, you've got a couple of options. You can either try and whisk it off with isopropanol, but isopropanol can be a bit aggressive, and I have seen it take the surface off discs before. Um, so, you know, you might want to do that, you might not. What I ended up doing with this disc was um, cutting open the sleeve um, and sliding it out completely, the middle bit, and giving it a bath with some fairy liquid and then letting it dry and then slipping it into a new clean clean sleeve, which was from a disc that I didn't care about. Now, I don't know whether you can see this, the, the disc itself was 
fairly damaged on you probably can't see it actually i can't really turn a light through it very easily but basically because the mold was on the disc oh you can possibly see i don't really see that there's light comes through that there but there's definitely a big old hole in it uh where the surface got torn off but that will be the mold getting stuck on the heads and just general grot and grime on the disc and if you run it through without cleaning it you end up with that so I had a, a, a damaged disc but in a new sleeve um, and ran it ran it through the process which I've just described and this is this is what sort of dropped out of it and it wasn't as bad as it could have been but it wasn't brilliant so yeah um, that is sector two i don't know whether you can see that orange one there that's sector two on track zero which is part of the directory there's something wrong there there was something wrong over here uh there's something wrong there um these little red bits aren't too much to worry about but there was also something wrong down here now this one isn't a problem um because if you can see it's a, a different shade of green those are these are empty tracks over here there's all em empty sectors there's, there's nothing in there so i wasn't too worried about this the problems were at, at the top and then on side two or side one sorry everything was okay apart from this little bit down here again which was blank anyway so not anything particularly to worry about um anyway i had a, a go with this it it didn't come out of the HXC software very well. I sent it a copy of the, the file to Keir Fraser, who ran it through Disk Analyze, which is what I just, just showed you, um, which came out with a much better copy of it, but it still wasn't perfect. Um, and then I had some other things to do, uh, but I sent it to Dave just to have a, have, a, have a play with. And he sent it to. Um, Keith, now this is uh, this is one of the tracks where where it was wrong. Just looking at the track view, so you can get it. You can get at the data, and you can see what's there. But the question is, what should be there? Anyway, this led to a bit of a discussion between Keith and myself um, on Facebook one evening, um, as we sat there with the directory. Uh, looking at it in DFS Explorer and a hex editor and attempting to work out what we thought should be where, where the files were, whether there was any difference between the files. And between the two of us, we, well, and mostly Keith, to be honest, we, we, got, we got the whole disk and all of, all of the files put back together just with a bit of detective work there. And, and ultimately now I think we've got working of of both of the Android discs that Paul Paul um, Paul gave to gave for us to, to image, so it was doable. But it, it it you know you have you had to get your hands a bit dirty. Anyway, that's that's basically that. I'm sorry that doesn't seem very organised this this whole thing, but I'm really 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 happy to take any any questions. Uh, okay um so what's the best thing if i look at the chat is that the best way of doing this i think wow okay right um so are all drives and heads made equal is there any better success i've got a piac drive with my high density five and a quarter inch it's the piac 55 f or something like that um so it worked fine um i've not had any any problems with it um and then the the 40 track one i've got i can't remember i got that new old stock off ebay for 20 quid um because it looked like something worth having and i'll have to take the lid off it and tell you what it is it, I think yeah. I can't remember which model it is. I can't remember which model it is. I've had no trouble. Three and a half inch, I used a, a Sony um, 920 and that, that's been reliable as anything. So, 
do I read the command screen from the grease weasel? Yes, initially. Um, I would. Uh, I tend to assume that you've got one hit on these things initially. So I would try and make sure that the disc is in the best possible condition I can before I attempt to read it. Um, then read it. And if it doesn't, work i'll give it another go or if it's a particular track i might go straight to that track so you can you can use the grease weasel software just to sample a range of tracks or a single track um so are the flux caps completely successful well the flux captures are completely successful they'll capture everything on the disc um the only bits where you you sometimes get these sort of weak pulses which read differently um which you can do with you know professional mastering equipment um but yeah it you'll you'll possibly get slightly different reads every time you do it there's flaky bits or fuzzy bits i don't know people call them different things and i'm sure there's big arguments about what they should be called um so you know it it, it will give you enough information that you can reconstruct the, the disc. It, it pretty much gets pretty much everything. If you really, really, really wanted to do it properly, you'd take a you'd take a reading off one of the test points before it goes through the amplifiers in the um, before it goes through the amplifiers in the floppy drive, and that would be you know the lowest sort of possible possible thing you could do. Um, so weak, I think, well, weak is, is just that. It's a bit that sometimes reads and sometimes doesn't. Uh, where else are we? Any attempt to fix dodgy pulses? Um, no one's written it, but there's absolutely no reason why we can't because all of, all of the tool chain that I'm using is completely open source. So you you could brute force it if you had a rough idea where you thought where you thought your dodgy bits were yeah i mean it just just go for it it's it's kind of so what that hxc software does those red marks where it thinks there are splices um and it very often if there's damage to the disc surface it looks like a splice it looks like that Track wasn't written in a continuous sort of stream of data, um, so so you can sort of you should be able to identify iffy areas and then attempt to fiddle with the bits until the CRC's worked. Sometimes though, it's the CRC is just registered as zero, which is doesn't really give you any indication as to whether you've got the right thing. So if the CRC itself is not right, then you know, yes, I think the other thing would be to, to repeatedly sample an area and, and, and probably use some sort of heuristic algorithm to try and work out what you think the most likely bit for anything is. Any more? Uh, no questions from me. I was just going to say thanks, Daniel. That was, that was great. I really enjoyed that. Oh, you're welcome. Um, if anyone thinks of anything, just ask on on the forum, or or you can nobble me on Facebook. I should say that the the grease weasel things themselves are, are really, really, really well supported by Keir Fraser. Um, even though that entire thing's open, open, he spends an awful lot of time on it and and is very sort of attentive, with answering questions and 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 fixing bugs as well, because there obviously are bugs still in the software. So people encounter from time to time um but these days i i i i honestly i don't think i could recommend going another route with it i don't i don't think that you gain anything from going with a cryoflux or anything like that in fact i think it's it's a bit of a retrograde step these days so i'd be worried that you'd be reading with errors and only discovering them later when looking at the pc so <clears throat> I think the thing is, you don't, well, assuming that you've got a, a cl clean drive heads and 
and a clean disk, you're basically saying that um, a disk is the question. I guess the question is: Is the error something that you can read through, or is the error something which is actually you've just lost that that data from the surface of the disk? Realistically, you're working on a PC which is next to um, the drive that you've read from, so you're going to see that error as soon as you load that that file. So there's nothing to stop you going back and rereading that pack again if it appears to be there appears to be an error on it. Um, if you allow the thing just to hammer hammer away at the disk, you may well just be destroying more of more of the data or clogging up your heads for, for later down. At least you get a chance to breathe, think about what you're going to do next and then do it. I, I think we always, you know, I, I I want to set my cryoflux up to to read um, attempt fifty rereads if it couldn't read a track, and it it did basically grind its way through a disk surface, which was not particularly useful because I left it on its own doing it, and it, and it then ripped up further tracks down the disk as it managed to get something that seemed to make sense to it and then continue to burrow a, a groove across the disk surface. So I'd prefer to only let it can you swim it? lots of disks in one go. Um sorry I'm, uh, if anyone can see the, the text that's what I'm replying to at the moment. Um not conducive of reading lots of disks in one go if there's an L element of doctrine that it results. I would I would argue that you you should. I mean to be honest actually one thing I would say is that you can you can just plug in some level of decoding and I think Kier is in the process of plugging in some level of decoding in the Cryoflux soft, I mean sorry in the Grease Weasel software. So at the moment you can read directly to HFE and I think you should be able to read directly to sector image as well. But um you're not you're not doctoring the images you're looking at them and checking them and i'd argue if what you're trying to do is preserve things you should be you shouldn't be sort of running through headlong in a sort of conveyor belt fashion you should probably be taking your time with each image i know that that's probably irritating but um you know i think that an android attack one is a case in point that that needed time to look at and consider and 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 work out what best to do with it um i just i you know if you want to get through an awful lot of discs and awfully quickly then yeah yeah by all means are there any plans to host an scp archive i think there should be i think that would be the ideal thing to preserve um don't know where we'd do it and how we'd do it, but I, I genuinely think that that's, that's what we should be keeping. I think if you talk to Keir Fraser, you'll say that there are a couple of things that SCP as a format can't quite capture, but with a couple of extensions it could. Um, and I think that's probably a, a, a broader discussion that needs to be had. So if anyone has any ideas about that. Daniel, I have a question. Um, sure. uh, some of the eighty five and a quarter uh, eighty track drives have extra tracks on them. Yeah. Is this the case with three and a half inch? Drives? Yeah, three and a half go up to eighty four very often. Oh, that's good because I've got a piece of software, DOS software on um, five and a quarter that uh, actually stores the how many installations you have um <laughs> on the uh, you're past the 80 track so i want to convert that down into three and a half so i can actually <laughs> use it yeah no it will um there at least i've not seen a five and a quarter that's gone past 82 tracks but i've seen three and a half go 82 or 84. that's lovely thanks That's an electron exile, I think. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think HSE is a really, really good sort of compromise between file size and um, sort of serving the original what was on the disk. Um, simply because you can run you can run these things unmodified and unhacked from HFE files, um, but obviously it does lose some of some of the stuff and and ideally I think we would look to try and preserve everything as SCP files. At least then you can always go back to the source and do something else with it if we decide that some, if someone decides that something else is better at a later date. But the more data we can store, the better. I would always say. Thank <laughs> you.